Ruthie. It is so good to see you today. I'm so excited to have you on the Raw Beauty Talks podcast. Full disclosure, everyone, we already recorded this entire episode. I went to edit it, so excited to share everything that we had talked about with everyone. And this is the sound I was getting on Ruthie's microphone. I was like, oh my God. Um, no worries. I'm so excited to get to visit with you again. What a great excuse. It's honestly like the sinking feeling in your stomach when you have a guest like you and you know that you're on tour, you're doing stuff. I mean, you're on tour in a different kind of way right now. Because <laughs> At your living room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On tour from home. Um, but you never want to, you know, take up more of your time and you shared your story, but hey, everything happens for a reason. Yes, no worries at all. I'm so happy to be with you again today. This is so treat. for those of you who do not know Ruthie already, you have to head over to follow her on Instagram. She is a speaker, a writer, a podcast host, a stylist. I just recently discovered on your site as I was peeking around in there doing, you know, these beautiful um, styling of homes and of decor. Yeah, well, that's half life. I did do that. I don't, I mean, now I mostly, I don't really do it anymore. I do it for myself and for friends, but I don't do it like as work anymore. Uh, but it was, it was kind of an entry point after uh, my marriage ended. It was kind of what I first started doing yeah. after in my bed for seven years and not working at all. It was kind of my toe back into the world. So I'm really grateful for that outlet. Like so grateful you, you're just a very gifted woman all around. And I think so many of your gifts come from your story, which I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share a piece of your story and some of the lessons that you learned along the way. Ruthie is the author of a book that was released recently and has been, I mean, everybody is talking about this book. It is so beautiful, so raw, and there are just so many gems throughout the whole thing. So um, her book, There I Am, is available. We'll obviously link to that in the show notes. But Ruthie, can you just start us off by telling us, I mean, I've obviously just shared all these titles that you have as a woman, <laughs> but can you share a little bit about the journey as you gathered these titles and um, the journey that led to you writing this stunning book? Oh, first off, thank you so much. That is so generous and so kind of you. I'm really appreciative. And yeah, so I, I just released my first book and it's basically, it's a memoir and it's, it's, it's uh, called There I Am, The Journey from Hopelessness to Healing. And it's basically my story of, you know, I grew up South Louisiana on a farm and um, two older brothers that I knew of. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the book. Um, and, you know, I, I had a pretty simple life. I mean, we had hard stuff just like everyone else, but I felt very loved and cared for. I had a lot of friends and it wasn't until my senior year, you just heard my little dog run by, sorry about that. Okay, um, this is raw. We're <laughs> he's the best. Um, and my senior year of high school, I had gathered a bunch of friends together to go to Baton Rouge and uh, to go to this place called Celebration Station. I, that's the third time in my whole life that I've heard her bark. Literally, she doesn't bark. What was that, sissy? No, ma'am. I just found this dog three weeks ago in the woods, and she's the best thing ever. It's what? Like, it's, yeah. I literally, I was camping, and she was like 15 pounds underweight, covered in ticks and fleas. It was so sad, and she's the oh sweetest. You just can't even believe the kind oh. of She's that ever existed. Cameo. Bring her up on oh, yeah, she <laughs> will for sure. What a dream. Um, her name's Sissy Spacek. And so basically, <laughs> as you do, um, I we had stopped at a gas station, whatever. So I pulled out in front of an ambulance and he hit me on my car door going 65. And I broke three ribs, punctured my lungs, my lungs collapsed, my spleen ruptured, and I broke the top two vertebrae in my neck, C1 and C2. So I had a 5% chance to live and a 1% chance to walk. And I was very fortunate to be, I mean, if you're going to get hit by something, <laughs> listen, ambulance. I mean, he knew how to stabilize my neck. He knew not to pull me out of the car. Like we, I would not be here. Um, so 
that was a wild experience. I don't remember much from it. I was on life support. Um, I was very lucky in the sense that I was very healthy and young and had all that on my side. And so I healed very quickly. I, they were able to get me off life support after about a week to do my spinal cord surgery. I mean, they had already removed my spleen and put in chest tubes for my lung, you know, all of that. But, um, they couldn't do the neck surgery until I was stable and breathing on my own. And so they went in and they took bone from my hip and fused it into my neck with a uh, wire. And that's just that, I mean, that was what you did back then. And I was in the hospital about a month. I left with a big old neck brace and a bunch of scars that are hidden by clothing and hair that you never know otherwise, besides this like neck brace, you know? And I wore that for about five or six months, but really, I mean, I was so fortunate. I mean, I went back to school after Christmas. I graduated on time. I cheered at our last basketball game. I, you know, by looking at me, you'd never know. And all of, you know, if, unless I like danced too much, I would get sore, but I really didn't have any residual effects at the time. And so even talking about it, I was very, very disassociated. And I would talk about it in third person, like it had happened to someone else. And that's kind of what it felt like. Like it felt like a cool story. And I love sharing stories yeah. that Yes. But it happened to me, but I was so removed. And I'd always say, oh, it was way harder on my family and my friends than it was on me. Because I just didn't really remember much and I was disassociated. And so graduated, went to college, still very disassociated. I very much had different eating issues throughout all of that time. I, I would just eat my feelings like a crazy person. I think I was just trying to stuff the feelings that I didn't know how to process and I didn't know how to let myself feel, you know, and I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't grow up in a home that knew how to process hard emotions. I'd never done counseling, you know, and so I just stuffed it and stuffed it, but I grew up in the South. It's like, you show up, you be pretty, you smile, you be kind. You're not allowed to kind of show hard, bad, quote unquote emotions. And so I didn't, I stuffed them down mostly with food and then graduated, came to Nashville, met my first boyfriend, my parents were so stoked he was a boy because they were convinced I loved girls, which I was like, I wish. What a dream that would be. I wish I loved girls. I wish that was my journey. Um, maybe in another life. So I, um, we got married after literally 10 months because we were just the sweetest little idiots and trying to be earnest little Christians and felt guilty about having sex. I'm not even kidding. But you wanted to so badly. So you were like, we've got no, we were and felt guilty about it. <laughs> but that's how I got married so fast because we felt oh, shame. So, and like where I grew up, I was told, you know, my, the body was, you know, the flesh is deceitful and deny that. And all these stories, there were so many stories around that. And I was a broken, depraved wretch in this church that we were a part of. And so there was just so much shame and guilt and all the things. So we got married. We're excited to start our lives together, hoping that would make things feel better and okay. And um, about a year into that, I was walking in front of this Smoothie King and Starbucks one day and this crazy shooting pain went up my head that I remember thinking I had either been struck by lightning or I'd been shot. Like that's how severe and intense. Yeah. Yeah, it was so debilitating, that pain. And I fell down, blacked out for a second, was left with this like black inky in my eyes, in my brain, and like this crazy migraine. And I didn't know what the hell had happened to me. It scared me to death. And that shooting pain started happening more and more often. We started going to see all these doctors. And every time I'd see a doctor, you know, they would have me do a film and the film would come back and there was this like black spot on my film. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's just the magnet, the machine interacting with the wires from your spinal cord fusion, everything around it looks fine. We started a ton of different therapies, nothing helped. And then they started me on narcotics because I was in so much pain and not functional and, and just, you know, miserable and nothing was helping me and I wanted to not hurt. So I just took whatever they recommended, you know, and that started me on a pretty dark path. And I, when it all kind of came to a head, I mean, I basically, I stopped working. I stopped being able to show up as a partner, as a sister, as a friend, as a, you know, anything, because I was just in so much pain. And so I basically just lived in my bed and that became more and more of my day in, day out for almost four and a half years. 
Wow. Until finally this one, I mean, I saw so many doctors in that time and just, they gave me more and more drugs, you know, and it's not for <laughs> narcotics are not created for chronic conditions. It's for acute conditions. And so you just need more and more and more to really, for me, it was just to not get sick. It was barely even touching my pain at that point, you know, yeah. and you just become a shell of yourself. Your brain is not intact. You're not thinking the way that you would think. It's just, everything's a fog. And finally, a doctor was like, I can't tell you what's going on until I see what's under that spot. And basically, a $50 x-ray showed that one of the wires from my spinal cord fusion had broken and pierced into my brain stem. Oh, and I mean, it's insane. And I'm so, I'm so lucky to be here. I'm the only human in the world that's ever had that. Um, I shouldn't be, I mean, that's in your reptile brain. So like if you're on life support, they're keeping your reptile brain alive for your organs to keep functioning and like for you to keep breathing, you know? And I, I mean, I shouldn't be speaking, walking, breathing, talking, anything like I shouldn't be here. And so I'm so, I'm so lucky. Um, but it was also just incredibly terrifying and, horrific. And I felt like this ticking time bomb. Like if I don't get this out, I'm going to be paralyzed or I'm going to die, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, I, it was terrifying. I was frozen. Like my fight, flight, freeze. I just froze. I just read Harry Potter and was like, I can't deal, shut down, you know, check out. Which and, makes so much sense. I feel like they talk about how sometimes people will be experiencing pain or they have a lump and they don't know what it is yet. Yeah. And as soon as they're diagnosed with the cancer or the wire poking into their brain, yeah. it becomes a whole nother level because now psychologically you understand what's happening in your body and we attach that to all these different types of things. So yeah. the stress that that then puts on you, although of course you want to know, can be really challenging on its own. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it was horrible. And I, um, you know... It was one of those things where insurance wasn't going to cover it because it was a pre-existing condition. And so um, my dad, who we called Papa, was going to come see me, had planned to come see me and visit and tell me that he'd sell our farm so I could have the surgery because insurance wasn't going to pay for it. And I know he's just the most precious thing in the whole wide world. And this was a few weeks after we had found out about the wire. And um he was halfway to visit halfway to, to me. It's like a nine hour drive and stopped to visit our Amish friends. Um, my dad like plowed our garden with a mule. I mean, he did everything the way the Amish did it and did everything old school. He's just the most unique. I don't even know how to describe this man. He's just this larger than life, most magnetic, like his eyes just glow. Like you wanted to be in his presence because it felt so good. And I just wanted my dad, you know, and he had told my mom and my godfather that he was going to tell me that he would sell this farm for me so I could have the surgery because it was like I had to have it, right? And we get a phone call um, that he ended up falling down a flight of stairs while he was there and ended up passing of brain damage. Oh, and I have full body goosebumps right now. Yeah. Um, how much can one person take? Like, it sounds like it's like a horror movie. <laughs> That's at the time that is what it felt like. I I I would pinch myself because I would literally make myself bleed because I would think I'm in a nightmare. Wake up. This cannot be your life. And you know, now of course I can look at that. And when you say this can't be my life, there's so much privilege in that. You're like, because it could be someone else's, but this can't be mine, not me, you know, and I just, it felt so, I felt very, um, I felt abandoned. I felt left. I felt like God must hate me. I mean, I had a lot of stories, a lot of limiting stories that I held real strongly onto that it just, you know, I was miserable and felt very hopeless and very terrified. And it was just a massive loss, not only just for me and my family, but our whole community. Like he was just the most loved, like every time he'd leave us when we were children, he'd say, I love you so much. Remember your manners and always look out for the little guy. And that was his whole thing. Like he wanted us to look out for the person that everyone else misses and enter in with them and love them. 
And that's what he, that's how he lived his life. And, you know, after he died, my godfather ended up setting up this medical fund in my daddy's honor. And, um, it was so crazy because literally people started coming out of the woodworks and would send money in and say, your dad bought my prom dress. Your dad pays my rent. Your dad sent me on my senior trip. Your dad fixed my roof. Your dad sent me to my freshman year of school, like on and on. And the full amount of money was raised for me to have this crazy spinal cord surgery, this life or death surgery, because he had loved people so well. So he did take care of me you know, and it was like, it just felt like such an honor to be Lloyd Litzy's daughter, you know, like this man who has shown up in this world and loved people so well because of that love, like I have another chance at life, you know, and, and so um, I ended up being pursued by doctors because they like get off on being the first one <laughs> to do anything. They love that shit. So I ended up, um, I ended up choosing Mayo Clinic and this top neurologist and top orthopedic surgeon did it together. And they're like, we hope this will help with your pain, but this is like, we want to keep you walking, living, breathing, speaking, you know? Yeah. And it was so scary. And I just wanted my dad and the surgery was super traumatic. I talk about it in the book, you know, I had been on so many narcotics for, the, so I was on the highest level of fentanyl patch, which they give dying cancer patients and hydrocodone and all these drugs that it was so hard for them to get my pain under control because you know, my tolerance to this high level. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like it probably, they would have had a sedate of freaking elephant to like make me not feel the level of pain that I was in. And it was traumatizing truly. And, and I just, but in the same vein, I left there walking with another neck brace with my head half shaved again. And with the wire in my hand, I walked out of there like seven days later with the wire in my hand. So they ended up taking bone from my hip, removing the wire that was just in my spinal cord, not all of it, because a lot had grown into my brainstem, um, into my spinal cord. And then they refused it with titanium screws. So, you know, it was actually interesting, like the shooting pain did stop, but I ended up getting massive neurological pain and damage. And so my whole entire right side of my body just feels like it's on fire all the time. And like I was in just as much pain, but just a different type. And so I actually walked straight back to my bed. And at that point I felt even more hopeless because this one, it felt like my one chance to ever feel better. And I put my, all of my eggs in this basket and all of my hope in this thing outside of me to fix me and to make me better. And I was so grateful to be walking and alive, but I was still in just as much debilitating pain. And so I felt way more hopeless after that surgery. Cause I was like, this is the rest of my life. And I'm going to live in these, in between these four walls in this bed forever. And I was 30 years old and I just was like, and I was on even more drugs at that point. And it just felt so hopeless and dark and there was no out for me. Like, and could you imagine how painful and miserable that would be for a partner? Like, so I was just going to say, I mean, first of all, I've I had tears rolling down my face listening to you talk about this story and especially the part about your dad because I can't like being somebody who's so close to my dad I can't even imagine and then this piece about you know him always saying look out for the little guy and yeah. now when I look at you and hear your story and have read your book you you're living through your dad and that message that he gave you and that message also saved your life so it's just such a beautiful um, you know, circle of life that we see and, um, and, and such a beautiful way of showing how these little acts of kindness mm -hmm. are really what change the world. It yeah. really is all that matters. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think we get lost in feeling like we have to do the big things all the time and we have to show up in the big ways. Mm -hmm. And I think your dad was just such an amazing testament to the fact that it's, it's the little things. It's yeah. not one person in your community. It's, mm -hmm. it's the teeny tiny things that add up to create mm -hmm. the big change. And now here you are with 
a book that is selling around the world and um, sharing such a beautiful message. I know the story is not even done yet, but I'm like, we could lock it up right now and everyone would have a million lessons to take from this episode. So yeah, thank you for, thank you for sharing everything so openly. Okay. And then my next question was, where's your husband this whole time? So like he, how old was he? This must be hard for him to navigate too. Oh my God. Can you comprehend? I mean, I have so much that precious man, like how painful and hard we were babies. You know, he was 21 when we got together and this started right after a year within our marriage and who knows how to handle pain and trauma. Like we didn't know how and we were just doing the best we could. And he stood by me and supported me the best he knew how. And I will forever be so grateful for him. And, you know, after, so I went back to my bed and it was super hard. And, um, about two years later, you know, a lot of things happened, but I ended up catching this bacterial infection called C. diff. My husband was on tour. He couldn't deal with it at that point, which I also totally understood. Like it was just too much. And I could tell our marriage was coming to an end. And, you know, up to that point too, there had just not been room for him to not be okay. My pain was always bigger and the number one thing, and it took up all the room. So like there wasn't space for him to struggle and not be okay. And that would just be so hard, like so incredibly painful and hard. And it just, it broke like, and it makes a lot of sense to me why it broke. And um, so he was gone and I, I literally, I mean, I had a full on mental breakdown. I stopped sleeping. I was so sick. I kept ending up in an emergency room with the C diff, which is such a nightmare. And I just, it took me over the edge. It was my breaking point. And I never had felt shame like that before. Like I was not functional. I went 20 something days without sleeping, which you go insane. Mm-hmm. You literally go mad. And I couldn't think straight. I I would have panic attacks all night long. long. I would, I wanted to die. I thought I was a complete burden that everyone's lives would be better without me there. I would think about my dad and I had all these false limiting stories thinking how ashamed he would be of me. And I had a dear friend who I dedicated my book to my dad and my girlfriend, Laura, who was killed by a drunk driver when we were in college. And on paper, my injuries were way, way more severe than hers. And she died. And I, she was just the brightest light you could ever imagine. And I would think Laura should be here and not me. Like Laura would be out changing the world. And I am just taking, that's Mm. all I'm doing is taking and like being a burden on all of these people. And I wanted to not be there. I would like pray, like, let me fall asleep and not wake up, you know? And it got so bad. I mean, I had to move home. I had to move back in with my brother and his family because I was not functional and it was so dark and they wanted to send me away to get help because obviously I was not okay. And that, because I cared so much about what everyone else thought about me, I was like, no, ma'am, no, sir. This is not my journey that I literally because of my own pride and fear and all the whatever else, I started weaning myself off the drugs the next day just so they wouldn't send me away. It's almost like I wanted to prove to them that that's not the problem, which right. it's insane. But whatever it took, that was the best decision I ever made was to get off of these freaking drugs. And it was really difficult. It took me about four months. And, you know, I had been trying to numb all of my pain and not feel it because I thought it would kill me. But when you numb your pain, you also numb every beautiful, good thing in your life. And I was a literal shadow of myself. I was just, I was like vacant. And as I started de-thawing, I mean, I had to relearn how to live, like literally relearn. My brother was like, babe, you can lay in your bed and hurt all the time, or you can get up and like be with people and try to love people and experience life and serve and, and hurt. And right now, those are your only two options. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> I'll try to live and hurt, you know? And again, it was literally like, I had to make a list like 8 a.m. You get out of bed and you're not allowed to get back in it until it's dark outside. And I would like look around like, what the 
fuck do people do all day? Like, <laughs> what do people do? I laid in my bed and watched trashy reality television and ate my feelings and took drugs. Like, that's what I did for seven years. What are y'all doing? Because I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to be doing, you know? And so I'm like, would have to write this list. I'm like, okay, 805, brush teeth. I mean, it was that basic. And I would do that every day. And then a few weeks in, as the drugs were like, I started sleeping and my drugs started, de you know, de-thawing. I was almost like it was like melting. I made this list and I don't know if it was like my dad. I don't know if it was God. I don't know if it was my higher self, my guides, who knows, who cares? But some <laughs> told me, make a list of all the things you loved before you had pain. Mm. Because I didn't remember anything, nothing had brought me joy. And I was like, those are the truest parts of you. And so I remember I wrote down like, you love flowers. I'm like, no, I don't. Like, yes, you do. You love them. I wrote, you love sunsets. I'm like, who cares? Like you do. You love them. You love sunsets. I wrote, um, you love people. And I remember honestly having this like maniacal, almost dark laugh come out. I'm like, no, I do not. I hate people. They're the worst. <laughs> I'm like, no, Ruthie, you love people. And so from there, every day I would make myself do one of the things on that list. Like I had friends that, you know, I had a friend in high school whose husband was dying of colon cancer and I'd go sit with her in the hospital or I would go pick flowers and bring them to someone or I'd go sit outside and just watch the sunset. And again, you know, because I had been numbing all the pain, I numbed all the beautiful things and it took time. Like at first I felt numb and dead inside and I felt nothing, but something in me was like, you have, it's a practice. Yeah. You have to go cultivate this joy and you have to like sit outside and make yourself look for beauty, even though you don't feel it. And, and it did, it was like a very slow trickle, but slowly, slowly I started to feel again. And like the motion had to come before the emotion. Whereas so often we think once I feel better, then I'll do this thing. And there's no such thing. You just show up as you are because exactly as you are is exactly how you're meant to be. And like learning to accept that where I am is just, this is what it is right now, you know? And it's been such a journey. It's been such a journey. And I remember in that time here in this quote that the deeper sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. It's from the prophet. It's a Khalil Gibran quote. And I remember literally claiming that and like bawling my eyes out. I was like reading a blog at like two in the morning when I couldn't sleep and being like, that is going to be my story because of the level of this loss, but you have to let yourself feel it. <laughs> I am going to experience joy and beauty on such a deep soul level. And that became kind of my mission. And, and it was, and it was a, it was beautiful and it was so hard, but I felt all of it. I mean, I remember looking at my nieces and nephews, which most of them had been born during that time where I was numbing out and living in my bed. And so I hadn't seen them. And all of a sudden it's like, it gave me eyes when I allowed myself to feel this pain. I'm like looking at these children that are like the most miraculous, beautiful, these kids, I'm so in love with them. I can't, and I had not seen them. I had totally missed these kids. I had not experienced them at all because all I had thought about was my pain. And because, you know, I think we teach people how to see us. And I was so, all I thought I was, was my pain. That's all I thought my identity was. And so because we teach people how to see us, that's all anyone thought about me too. So anytime I'd see anyone, they'd be like, how are you? And I found comfort in that because I would be like, that justified me living in my bed and not working in, in my sweet little sick brain at the time, you know? And when I was weaning off all this stuff, I was like, I want, when people leave my presence, I want them to feel seen and I want them to feel cared for. And I want them to look, feel le looked out after and held and not sorry for me, you know, like there's no reason to feel sorry for me. And it just became this real shifting and it was gradual and it's been ongoing. This journey has been, I mean, that was seven years ago and what's happened since then and what's unfolded and what so much of it's been this unlearning <laughs> and remembering and like 
unlearning the stories of brokenness and that I was a broken, depraved wretch, but that I am, no, I am inherently worthy. I am so good and so deserving and I am not broken. Broken, fucked up things happened. That's, we're walking around traumatized, we're not broken. And so remembering, like, because I'm breathing and I'm alive, I am inherently valuable and worthy and love and light. And this divinity is that power lives here. I don't have to look outside of me to be fixed. <laughs> you know, I started learning about mind body connection. I started learning about embodiment. I started learning about how my body had held on to trauma. And as I go in and do this trauma work, I can release pain, which like, I didn't believe that was even a possibility. I'm the only human in the world. I was so parked on that lane of like, my pain had been worse every year for so long that I didn't think I could ever be better. And I thought if I went into my pain, it'll kill me. It was so great, you know? And, but that's the only way to heal. Like it's the only way to heal. So it's just been, oh my gosh, such a crazy, traumatic, beautiful, incredible journey. And I look at all of those milestones of those really painful moments where I felt so alone and I felt so left behind and I felt so abandoned and I felt so hopeless. And I can look at all of it now and with the depths of my soul tell you that like, I wouldn't change one single thing, that all of those things had to happen because it became the invitations, the entry points for me to actually come home to myself mm -hmm. and to wake up to my consciousness, to wake up to like the divinity that's always lived inside of me, the healing and love and light that's always been here that I don't, if my life had turned out great and everything looked the way I'd hoped, I'd probably be a pretty surfacey. I would have never woken up. Like that's the entry point. And I don't know why Mrs. God set it up that way, her <laughs> school, but like that's, that's our invitation. That is it. I wouldn't, I literally would not change one single thing. And it's, I've become the human that I think I came here to be. And I have gotten to become and sh to be able to show up in the world as the person I'm created to show up as, not despite my pain, but because of it. Yes. Yeah. It's a privilege. And, you know, all of this is just, everything you're saying is just so timely right now because I think so many people who are listening, maybe they can't relate to that level of pain that you experienced mm -hmm. or the addiction to narcotics, but you just said a stream of words that attached to that time for you, hopelessness, yes. uncertainty, shame, um, loss, grief, and everybody experiences those things at some point in life. And as a collective global community right now, yes. so many of us are experiencing that in regards to relationships, people that we love, careers, even things like vacations that yes. people were waiting for and hoping for and that feel like they've been taken away. So everything that you're saying right now really can resonate and hit home with anybody um, who's alive <laughs> because we all experience pain and we all experience loss and grief. And so often these things, we are, they're uncomfortable. Like you said they're hard, they're challenging. We don't want to sit in them. We don't want to feel them. But as you said, they're also the portal to so much joy. And they teach us how to find our strength. They teach us what matters. I love that idea that you shared. Um, you call it your joy list of things that bring you joy. And I think if anybody you know wants a, an action step or, some, or a tool to take from this episode that right there is an amazing starting point yeah. i work with so many women and they're like i don't know what brings me joy anymore i don't know 
what I love right now. I forget, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got kids to take care of or my job got busy or my parents said I should do this or that or the other thing. So exactly how you described it, go back to what you loved as a child, yeah. what brought you joy, that last moment that you can remember it and write out that joy list. Take a picture of it actually and tag at Ruthie Lindsay, tag at Raw Beauty Talks in it. We would love to see your joy list. That would be such a gift for both of us. That would be such an honor. And you know, another practice that I've been taught before when you're wanting to tap back into your inner child, because like we're all... Our inner, our wounded inner child more often than not is in the driver's seat and we're just not even aware of it, you know, and, but some, one thing that you can do to like reparent yourself and to go back in and honor that, that beautiful, beautiful inner child within you is you can ask, you can write prompting questions and write out with your non-dominant hand the answer. And that's a really beautiful way to hear back from your inner child and to hear what your inner child wants to say to you. And it's, it's really profound. I, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful practice that I was taught at OnSite actually. And whew, it, it's, it's pretty, it's incredible. And it's such a loving thing. Like, you know, there's so many ways that we can go back in and take care of our little selves, <laughs> you know, and ask your little, like, what, what brings me joy? What is something that is fulfilling and life-giving to you? And how can I like honor you? You know, how can I love you? Well, how can I show up for you and take care of you? And our brains are so incredible because our limbic brain does not know time. Like they always say at once, like it's never too late to go back in and create the most beautiful childhood for yourself because your brain literally doesn't know time. So you can go back in and go into the most effed up experiences of trauma or just when you weren't attached to, or you weren't attuned to, or people didn't show up in the way that you needed them to show up because they were wounded people. Like they weren't bad people. They were just hurt people and they didn't know how to do it for themselves and no one did it for them. But what we can do, and that is not your fault. It is not your fault, but it gets to be our responsibility to heal. So we can go back in to those painful places and love ourselves and take care of ourselves and remove ourselves from situations that were really harmful and tell ourselves all the things that we were always longing to hear. And literally what's so brilliant is your brain doesn't know that that's not real, that that's not happening because it is real. You're making that happen. You're creating that reality for yourself. And like, we can do that. And we're so deserving of that. And that all ties back into remembering just what is so right with us and not what's wrong with us. When you're looking at your little self, you're not going to talk to them the way that we talk, that those limiting voices where we talk to ourselves. Yeah. No, no, you can't. It's, it, it, you know, it, it, nobody would talk the way that they talk to themselves to a child or anyone else for that matter. And yeah. so I love, this is such a beautiful exercise. So simply asking a question to your little self, to that younger version of you, and then writing it out with your non-dominant hand, which would be a nightmare for me. I feel like I'm so tempted to try this right now, but I, it obviously activates different parts of the brain and gets you out of your conscious mind and into the subconscious. Exactly. Fascinating. For anyone who's listening right now who doesn't know, what is OnSite? OnSite is, oh my gosh, it's so profound. They're doing actually a ton. It's based outside of Nashville, and that's how I've been so lucky to have access to it. But people come from around the world. Like I've had people in my groups from London, from Germany, you know. Yeah. But right now, of course, no one's doing anything in person. So there's so much content online that online that you can get from them, but it's basically an emotional wellness. It's like heart camp. <laughs> it's literally heart camp. And when you go in person, you give up your phone for a week. You don't tell anyone what you do for a living because they talk about how we walk in through the world as human doings instead of human beings. And so it's about remembering our inherent value and worth, not in what we do, but who we are because we are freaking breathing. And it's all experiential therapy. So even the online stuff, it walks you through experiential therapy. When you see things 
acted out from your past, from your loss, from your trauma, it activates a different part of your brain where it makes sense. Like you can't heal something that you're not aware of. Right. You can't. And you, unless you allow yourself to feel it, you can't heal it. And they always say when our responses to things are hysterical, really big, they're always historical. You're just scratching the scab off a wound that's wanting to be healed. Mm -hmm. It's coming up, it's bubbling up and it feels so big and so bad. And it could be from a trauma 30 years ago. And it feels like it's right now. Cause again, your brain doesn't know time. Yeah. It doesn't know time. So what they do is help you create these new neural pathways to go back in and to heal yourself. And that place has been one of the most profound places for me in my unlearning and my remembering of unlearning those limiting stories and remembering my inherent value and worth. And it's just, they have so many free sort resources online. And then they also have monthly things now that you can do online. I can't recommend it enough. I have, I get nothing for telling you all these things. I mean, I, you know, but I just, I like advertisement, but yeah. I always am hunting for tools for our listeners and you yeah. never know what will resonate with someone or what will be the right fit or what's going to pique their interest. And so, yeah. um, yeah, we can add that one to the toolbox. I'm dying to know, are you still in pain today? Is that neurological pain still there? Yeah, I am, but it's nothing like what it was. And I will continue to heal because the more I learned about the mind body connection and I started learning, like, listen, my neck looks more like a freaking toaster oven than it does a spinal cord. And if I can heal, we can all heal. We were created. Our bodies, our hearts, our spirits, our longing were created to heal. And my pain is so much better than it used to be. I mean, the things that I'm able to do now I just, it blows my mind. It's so, it can make me cry right now. I've been thinking about it. And I really believe that I'm going to continue to heal my body more and more. The more I, I still struggle with disassociation from some of its early childhood trauma, stuff that I am working through. And the more I do this work, the book, The Body Keeps the Score was the first one that opened me up to realizing that my body was holding on to trauma that I didn't even remember consciously. But there's so many practices and things that you can do to go in and to heal. And I learned from this one woman named Nicole Sachs, S-A-C-H-S, and she has a ton of resources online for free. And it's a program called Journal Speak. And it's, it's just ugh, literally, it's, it's, it's journaling, but it sounds way too simple to be something that can actually bring pain relief. Google it, check it out. It has been a massive um, form of relief for me of getting out, like, especially growing up in the South, like I said earlier, I wasn't allowed to feel dark, heavy, quote unquote, bad emotions, right. you know? And so you swallow those and they hold onto your body. And then an injury happens and it all comes up because again, it wants to be healed. And so, and your brain's kind of like, what hurts or what hurts worse? Like, I think the body hurts really bad. That other stuff would feel way worse. So we're not going to go there. So I'm just going to manifest as like only neck pain. It has nothing to do with emotions. That's what you think. Yes. And right. until you start going in, I mean, there are wounds that can happen in the womb. Like they've learned Peter Levine. I learned so much about pre-verbal trauma now that your body holds on to, your body remembers that you aren't even aware of, but you can go in and heal it. And so it's, it's so much better because of this healing journey. I'm just taking so much hope from your story. Obviously a lot of your journey is a combination of emotional, but presenting as physical pain. And I think if you can heal yes. physical pain at the extent upon which you felt it, yeah. that it gives everyone hope that they can heal their emotional pain, the mental pain that they've been through, the trauma that they've experienced in their life. And I just want to say, you know, I will be praying for you. I'll be rooting for you every single day and that you are helping so many people as you heal to heal themselves. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Everybody listening right now, um, go grab Ruthie's book. It is absolutely stunning story of resilience and hope, um, family and love. 
Ruthie, thank you for joining me again <laughs> for this episode. <laughs> Such a pleasure to talk to you. Great. And if anyone's also, if you go to my website, um, you can download the first chapter for free if you want to see if that's something that you're interested in. And there's like book club material. There's all kinds of resources on there, a lot of free stuff. Um, but yeah, this has been such a treat and I'm so appreciative of you and allowing me to like share my story with your audience and everyone listening. You know, I, I could be so bold to say this at the end, but I say this in my book too, you know, whatever, wherever you are and whatever place in your journey you're in, I hope by hearing my story that like, this is just a flashlight into all of the love, all of the hope, all of the healing, all of the light, all of this is already within you. This divinity is yours. This healing is yours. You don't actually need us. This is all for you. And I just, I'm sending you so much hope and love and I'm so honored to get to, to share, to share my message with y'all today. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ruthie. Honestly, your story is so profound and so beautiful. And um, I'm amazed that you can, this is all off the record, um, you can still share it and every time evoke emotion again, right? Like it can become very easy. I imagine you've shared the story 500 million times at this point. <laughs> to gloss over, but it's still so raw and real. And I think that's just a testament to how deeply you felt every part of it and how willing and open you are to sharing yourself with others so that they can you know, take something from your story. So thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.